but the way she says Charles, Charles, every five seconds, man. Hey guys, it's your girl Cameron and I'm back at it again with another video. And today we are going to be doing a deep dive on the gem that is Lincoln Heights. ABC Family's hit show that I know captured my heart. I started watching the show when I was about 12. I think it came out in about like 2007. But recently I had nothing to watch. And you know, TV has not been TVing these days. And I was like, I want to watch something nostalgic something that I used to love. I want to see if it's as good as I remember. So we found Lincoln Heights on Hulu and me and my mom rewatched it again. And when I tell you, I was like, I have to make a video about this because this show was so impactful and did so many things right. But also watching it back as an adult, I'm like, we got to talk. I knew I wanted to make this video and I took it as a sign when while I was watching it, I saw somebody tweet like, who remembers this show? This show is like amazing. And I was like, I have to do a video because I was currently watching it. And I think a lot of people who watched it realized it's such a hidden gem. It was such an underrated show. And I want to shine a spotlight on it today. So we're gonna do our deep dive. Grab your drink, grab your snacks. We're gonna get into it. It's going to be a long video. Follow me. I know it's probably been a long time since a lot of you guys have seen this. So bear with me, I'll make sure I add pictures, names, very thorough so that you guys can follow along with me. Like, comment down below. Did you used to watch Lincoln Heights? If you did, comment down below what was one of your favorite parts about the show and maybe something that you would have done different or maybe looking back, you're like, mm, that was a little sketch. Let's chat in the comments. Hit that subscribe button down below if you'd like to see more content like this. I do commentary on pop culture, music, TV shows, a little bit of everything. I like to talk. So if you like any of those topics, hit that subscribe button and let's just get straight into the video. All right, so let's talk about the premise of Lincoln Heights. So the show released January 8th, 2007 and spanned four seasons. The episodes were about 45 minutes apiece. But at this time, the seasons were only about 10 or 11 episodes long. If anybody knows anything about ABC Family shows, later on, like let's say Make It or Break It, Secret Life of the American Teenagers, Switched at Birth, they would have multiple seasons and at least like 25 episodes. So because Lincoln Heights was a precursor for a lot of these shows and came out before then, these didn't have as many episodes per season, which is, <sighs> pains me pains me but the premise of the show is essentially a family of five moves to a neighborhood kind of based in LA called Lincoln Heights and they move from their cramped apartment in a relatively nicer area to this home um, in Lincoln Heights. The father Eddie who's also a police officer grew up in Lincoln Heights and you might say why the hell would he move back to a place that's causing so much trauma, unsafe, a lot of crime? There is a police incentive to have cops move into the areas that they're patrolling. The department really believe they can get some schmuck to move into this town. I'm considering it. You got some guts, man. So they were able to get this giant house um, for a pretty good price. However, the house before was a former crack house and Eddie actually had busted this crack house. So I don't know how they were able to, not only okay, affording the house is fine, but like who paid for the repairs to get it basically turned around in about four months after he had busted the crack house. I think most people watching this were like, this isn't a great idea. So let's talk about our characters, okay? We have Eddie who is the father of the family and he is the police officer. He's the reason why they're in Lincoln Heights. For him, he not only looks at this as a way for his family of five to have space, have a yard, have a house, but it also feels like a redemption for him. We get a little bit into his past. Um, his mom was shot and killed right in front of his eyes by a gang probably some blocks over not that far i don't think lincoln heights is a super large city but rightfully so 
I mean, he had his life there, but once he got out, he didn't really want to look back when it came to living there and raising a family there. Personally, unpopular opinion. opinion. You know, Eddie's portrayed as this protector, but now that I'm at my age and re-watching this, nothing about this move was protecting anybody, right? Like, is he really a protector? Comment down below if you if you agree, you disagree. I personally feel like he put his family in, in harm's way, which I think is almost unforgivable. Not only you're moving them to a, 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 a bad area, but you're a cop. You're literally a target. Like people already don't like you because you're a cop. And throughout the series, I questioned how they tried to position Eddie as a protector, as like, the ultimate dad and really putting his family first but personally i think a lot of the reason why he wanted to move there was kind of selfish it just didn't make sense to me we have jen who's eddie's wife her and eddie got hit she got pregnant at 19 with their daughter cassie which we'll get to and she has a very tough family who's very successful so I think in some ways her family was disappointed with her choice to marry Eddie, right? And the way they chose to live their life. You know, she's a nurse. She did pretty good for herself. However, when she moves to the Heights, clearly her family's not happy, rightfully so, because it's not up to her standards and it's not safe for the kids. But also as a nurse, she's now working at a clinic that doesn't have many resources. And I guess to her family, they felt like you should have been a doctor or you shouldn't be working in this environment. You should be working in this environment. She was not convinced on moving to the Heights. Uh, the first episode or two, obviously she was very apprehensive. She was like, hell no. Essentially we wouldn't have had a show if she hadn't gave in. But I personally felt like she was the only one with some sense. Who's moving to Lincoln Heights? Because it ain't me and it's not going to be my kids. So she did end up succumbing to the pressure. And you can tell that she grapples a lot with wondering if she made the right decision or not to move her kids throughout the series. She even becomes a target, right? Because she works at a clinic and she's, you know, makes herself vocal in the community. So let's go to our kids. We have Tay Sutton. He's the youngest brother. And his role in the series, especially the first couple seasons, is more of a journey of self-discovery. He has no grasp of his interests fully. He's a young teenager. So what, maybe he was like 12 or 13 when the show started, but he never felt like he was cool enough, right? Like you're now moving into this area where you have kids his age who are selling drugs, who are, you know, who are getting into things that aren't conducive, right? Like they're just, they've grown up in that environment, so they don't know different. But he feels like he's square, right? He's like, Am I dumb? Like, mom, I want to be dumb. I'm not dumb, you know? And I think his positioning in the show is very powerful because I think some Black kids and Black boys feel that pressure, right? He was a clarinet player. I played the clarinet in fifth grade, but he's a clarinet player. He feels like he can't dance. He's smart. He pays attention in school and the other kids tease him for that. He doesn't have many friends. His role was very crucial, especially the first two seasons, I think in driving that point home is that he had to find who he was as a young you know, man, a young teenager. And then you see that progression throughout the show. Season three and four, it kind of started to go off the rails a bit, but he ends up being very into music. He becomes like a little mindless behavior protege, like Trey Song's protege. And he falls full fledged into making music and creating music. So that's kind of where his, his character leads to. Now we have Lizzie. Lizzie's the middle child, the youngest daughter of the family. And initially she's a basketball player. And I noticed throughout the series, I think they start losing the plot with her character. Like they have her doing a lot. They She didn't play basketball anymore. She had so many different interests. Like I felt like they kind of missed the mark with her character as the seasons went on. Some people may disagree, but rewatching it, I felt like her 
character kind of lacked focus so yeah she started off as a basketball player then they switch her up into like this artsy girl who likes music and and musical theater and the second time around i felt like they just made this little girl so they sucked the life out of her man she just had to stick up her butt lizzie didn't hang out with people her own age like why are you 13 hanging out consistently with like the deacon and the deacon's wife and 60 year olds and 50 year olds like do you have friends your own age and i don't know why that bothered me so much but everything she said was with such conviction and seriousness like lighten up and i think one thing about her that frustrated me which is very valid with i think what she's been through but she was empathetic to a fault and i think she gets this from her parents I mean, her dad's a cop who extends a helping hand to people who don't fucking deserve it. Her mom is, you know, a nurse and they're always letting people in the house and, and, and forgiving people. And it's this full circle moment. Let's say when she got kidnapped and we'll talk more in depth about that. I mean, she's sitting here trying to visit the guy in jail, write him letters, go on a forgiveness tour for what? Breaking her back to extend grace to people who didn't deserve it. Maybe I'm bitter, maybe I need to take a page out of her book, but I don't know, to me re-watching it, it was a bit overkill. Like it was just kind of annoying. I dare you, if you haven't rewatched it, rewatch it and you'll see what I'm saying. Everything she says, it sounds like she's speaking at a poetry slam. People say that living in the Heights is bad and that nothing good can come from it, but I know things can change. I've seen it. We should be happy Night Ray's alive she's acting some lines out like she's in a Tyler Perry Medea movie I was like this is too she too tough for me now we have the oldest child the oldest daughter Cassie um princess Cassie ah she's irritating she's probably the most annoying character on this show doctors are crap like it i don't even have to really say much about her character but the way she says charles charles every five seconds man she's an artist she has dreams to paint to go to school for art and she puts most of her energy and effort into those talents, which you see her try to bring into the community. Isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? However, I think she's insufferably selfish in a way. For her, it's all about me, 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 me. A lot of the times. And I think that's what irritated me. And that kind of takes us into Charles. We can't really talk about Cassie without talking about Charles. We definitely can't talk about Charles without talking about Cassie. Charles is Cassie's boyfriend. Charles um, moved to the Heights around the same time that Cassie did. He has an absent father and a horrible stepfather who tried to physically abuse him and a trash ass mother who never really believed him. Obviously she had to travel to work to make ends meet, but she's just overall a very absent parent he's also artistic we have a lot of artistic characters in the show um but artistic in the way that he has aspirations of designing cars him and cassie live two completely different family experiences and they navigate this drama throughout their relationship so that's not to say that cassie didn't have hardship but cassie has always had two parents two loving parents who were in the house and very dedicated to their children Charles, on the other hand, lives at home by himself probably 80% of this, the time. His nasty, racist ass, abusive ass stepfather just comes in and out as he pleases for at least the first season or two. So he doesn't really have that support. And I think Cassie's family has somewhat opened their arms to him a bit. So obviously there's that factor that plays into the relationship that I think puts a lot more pressure on it, right? 
And if we talk about it, right, we connect this back to the family. Eddie doesn't really like Charles for what he represents. He thinks Charles is a nice kid and Charles has absolutely defended Cassie, saved her life a couple times. And I think he's an overall nice kid, but I think Charles reminds Eddie of himself, right? And I don't know if I mentioned this, but Jen, her family is very successful, very well to do. And they were not fans of Eddie because they felt like he comes from this environment. He's always in trouble, his family's trouble, where he's from is trouble, his background is trouble, he got you pregnant at 19. And I think as much as Eddie had exp expressed so much disdain for how Jen's parents looked at him, he could kind of understand that concept when it came to Charles dating Cassie because he felt like you're just trouble. Your family isn't around, you don't really have a great life. You're always in some shit. I don't want you dating my daughter, which is 100% valid. But I think it was almost kind of like looking in a mirror. Charles is going to protect, but does he have all of the qualities that he would prefer his daughter to be with? No, but does any dad really want their teenage daughter being that serious with any dude at that age? No, but that's something that I saw with that dynamic and that relationship. All right, so now we got through the characters. We are going to talk about this damn house and this damn neighborhood. So we talked about the police program. There's an incentive for police to move into the areas that they patrol. They say, hey, if you know an area or a neighborhood that you're paroling in, you're more likely to see what's really going on on the streets. You can empathize. Maybe crime will go down because you're tapped in with the community. Unfortunately though, with areas like this, a lot of residents do not have trust in the police. And I, I do understand that. So it's a double-edged sword because if somebody like Eddie could move back as a cop who grew up in that community, he knows people, he was integrated into the community and they don't like him. What makes you think that some white cop who grew up in the Valley, who grew up in San Diego, Santa Barbara is gonna waltz in move into this neighborhood and it's going to be for their benefit. I don't, yeah, but that was that was the whole reason. One of the things that bothered me though about, like I know Eddie wanted to come back, move into this neighborhood, have this redemption arc and save his community. And I hate how this show sometimes made me a cop sympathizer, but hear me out. They kept trying Eddie, okay? At the beginning, season one, probably episode two or three, there was a shooting in the deli. Cassie was in there, Charles was in there. Oh boy, I don't remember his name, I'll put it up right here. But his friends came in, robbed the deli, he was at the getaway car, but obviously they were taking too long. So old boy jumps out the car, goes in, gets a gun, takes Charles, holds him hostage, and is like, I will shoot him if you don't let me go. And Eddie, of course, was dispatched to go handle this. So he sees his daughter on the ground. He sees Charles, you know, with a gun to his head. So Eddie shoots the guy because the guy like put off a shot towards him, which in my opinion, he was holding somebody hostage. So, and then I think his gun went off too. Regardless is one of the community leaders, the deacon, went on a smear campaign for Eddie, basically saying this was an unjust shooting um, even though a lot of them knew what happened and it became a whole frenzy and people were giving Eddie tons of shit for it. But I was like, he had a gun to somebody's head. It was a, a very tricky situation. And from that moment, if I were Eddie, I'd be like, I'm out. I'm not doing this shit. I, I try to protect this community. Some shit happens and my daughter's in there. He's holding somebody hostage. He shoots, I shoot. He dies, which obviously was the issue. And now I'm public enemy number one. They they were really trying Eddie a little bit. Like he was trying to do the right thing nine times out of 10. And they were still trying to play in his face. However, that goes back to the relationship that some of these communities have with cops. And it's valid, especially in these communities where the only time you see cops are when they're arresting somebody. They're not doing preventative measures. They're arresting somebody. So I get it, but I feel like because Eddie grew up in the community, I feel like they should have been like, like here, but they weren't. Now we talk about this neighborhood, the damn school. There were riots. I don't know if y'all remember the riot episode where they started fighting at the high school and then 
they started fighting at the middle school and then there was a whole riot in the city people were breaking into buildings and and stealing and all types of shit and personally this is where i'm like you know what forget the house forget the neighborhood why are y'all comfortable sending your kids to this school why are you comfortable sending your kids to get an education here that's the crazy part to me i feel like if they wanted to move into a house like eddie and jen maybe some years from now just the two of them fine have at it but you have talented smart bright kids and you're comfortable and even if you're not comfortable you're willing to let your kids go to a school like this it was so crazy to me because you didn't have to i think in season two eddie and jen were like we're selling our house it was after lizzie was kidnapped and they found a little white family to come in there look at it almost put an offer in on the house until the parents were like you know we were cool with living in the neighborhood like we know there's going to be some crime we know all of that but once we saw what the schools were like in the school system we have to rescind our offer we're not doing it right because you can't just think about the neighborhood you're living in you got to think about the schooling but i digress another issue that i had with this house and how jen and eddie operated and also i feel like eddie's not a protector at all is because they let everybody and their mama stay at that house Anybody was in trouble. Anybody needed saving, right? We talk about Dana, Eddie's first love, who he grew up with. She gets to stay. She was out basically selling her, selling herself, which she had to do what she had to do. I'm not judging that. But personally, I'm already dealing with everybody in the, the freaking neighborhood not liking me. And my kid's not safe. My kid was kidnapped. My kid is having gangs talk to him on the way out. Dana's son, Mohawk Boy, I don't even know his name, but he was bad. He was getting into gangs and issues and absolutely he needed somebody to be there for him. But it ain't gonna be me though. I got enough problems. And I think the issue was that they kept just letting people come into their house. They let Sage live there, Officer Lund's daughter. They let some lady named Hazel stay there. Hazel was an older lady who lived in that house as a kid back in the 50s. She stumbled in their house and they let her stay there. To be so unsafe and to have things actually happen to you, not threats, but actual things happen to you and to keep letting people stay with you was crazy to me. I'm just like, you need to make sure your home base is secure first before you let everybody else keep coming in here, wreaking havoc, projecting their issues and their problems. After something bad happens every single time, Jen and Eddie argue with each other about why they didn't move out. Why do we move here in the first place? I could have told you from episode one, maybe this was not gonna be a good idea. If it doesn't work, we don't have to stay. All I'm asking is that you give it a chance. After Lizzie's kidnapping, after that school riot, Eddie actually got shot that day. Old girl whose family used to live in a house come in and holding Cassie hostage in their own house, almost shooting and blowing her brains out, taking grazed by bullets twice. Cassie at the deli during that robbery we were talking about earlier. Tay being chased down and harassed by gangs. Tay just getting randomly beat up by some dude in the street. The family being targeted by that Jamaican guy who literally wanted Eddie's head on a platter. After all of that, are we still arguing? Cause y'all, like I would have been on the first way out i'm packing up the boxes i don't care what i'm losing in this investment i'm out and i know that's the premise of the show but i was like come on y'all come on and actually after the earthquake that happened i believe at the end of season three they did move out to another house for a second jen's dad bought them a house in a very nice area great schools but eddie's pride was like nope i want to pay for this house i can't pay for this house and we don't like this neighborhood. It doesn't have any soul. We miss the people. Y'all can go and visit. Guess what their stupid asses did? Went back to Lincoln Heights, moved into their house. This show is the opposite of good times. You know, in good times, they, they, they fought tooth and nail to try to get out of the projects. And every time they thought they were gonna get out the projects, something went wrong. They're the opposite. They trying to go back to the projects. They're trying to go back to the hood. And every time they get out or they have an opportunity to get out, 
they sabotage it or they come back. Just let that sit with you. That is exactly what this show is. We can't talk about Lincoln Heights without talking about Charles and Cassie's relationship. Young love, teenage love. I feel like growing up, this is what drove the show for me. It drove the show. And watching this as an adult with a fresh pair of eyes and a new lens opened my eyes. I was like, damn, there's a lot to unpack here. So let's talk about it. For their age, I think they were almost too serious about each other. And maybe that's because they were put in so many serious situations. Like Charles did not have a childhood where he could operate like a kid. Cassie did, but her parents put her in a position where she had to go through some things. And maybe that's a part of the reason why. But I felt like they were a little too intense for their age. And I think most people would agree. What drove me the craziest, if Charles did half the things Cassie did, Cassie would be crying in a corner. This is where the victim mentality comes in and this is where her selfishness takes over. When Cassie got a job at that cafe and her boss, that overage prick, who basically was preying on her and her talents, was essentially trying to like make his way in with her. Charles walked in on them slow dancing, damn near about to kiss, and Cassie had the audacity to be upset with Charles. Why are you here, Charles? Yo, I literally just saw y'all dancing, slow dancing. Nobody's in the store. You almost kissed, he clearly likes you, and I am public enemy number one. But when Charles got his little scholarship to study for design school, with that old hag, Sabrina. Mind you, there were a lot of overage pedophiles in this show. Clock it. But Sabrina was trying to make moves on Charles that he was not entertaining. And Cassie had the nerve to be so angry. But they were both pretty much in the same situation, being groomed by people who had power, who had the power to shape their futures. How come when you do it, he's supposed to understand? But when he's in a compromising position, you can't understand. Not right away, at least. For example, Cassie and Charles, when they had sex on stage, there was that Romeo and Juliet play going on. And her dumbass was like, oh, I want to do it again. Right? And Charles was like, maybe we shouldn't do it here. God. By who? Everyone's gone. Cassie was like, no, it doesn't matter. Nobody's gonna see us. She, she was working on that set. Like, you don't know that somebody, they usually are recording something or there's a camera up there. Like, you put both of y'all in a compromising position. You convinced him to sleep with you on stage, on the set. And then when somebody gets the recording and puts it out, you find a way to blame it on Charles. When it was your idea. If he would have said no, you would have felt like you were rejected. He couldn't win. He couldn't win. Lo and behold, by the end of the series, they decide that they want to get married, which is absolutely insane. I felt like that storyline didn't make much sense. This is a 30 year old couple stuck in 16, 17 year olds bodies. Now let's talk about some side plots that kind of had me shook. I feel like these need to be talked about just due to all of the different dynamics and the storylines that they were able to focus on. So I briefly mentioned this, but Lizzie, after Lizzie had gotten kidnapped by Boa, Boa obviously went to jail. And Lizzie, of course, just trying to be the good person that she is, decided to go and visit him and write him um, after he kidnapped her. And he was able to somewhat manipulate the situation where she felt bad. And I told you guys how this really played a part in me being so frustrated with her character and how her parents conditioned her. It's just like, you don't have to help everybody. You don't have to be everybody's savior. This person did a bad thing to you. You can forgive them for yourself, but you don't have to fix their life. To me, I think some people liked Lizzie's character because of that. And I think it actually made me irritated with her even more. Tay's music career, we talked about it briefly, but season three, especially season four, they dove into his music career. There was just a lot going on with Tay's character that I think was interesting, but I think it sometimes it didn't fit within the context of the plot. When they were like, well, we need to utilize this. We need to make this show a little bit lighter, lighthearted and fun. Let's talk about Lizzie and Johnny. So Johnny Nightingale was Lizzie's first boyfriend for real. Johnny was initially friends with Tay and then Johnny would come over 
you see Lizzie. Eventually, Lizzie and Johnny started talking. Johnny's a sweetheart, a little dorky, a little is an understatement, but overall a pretty positive, nice kid. And unfortunately, Johnny gets killed by a hit and run crash. And we see Lizzie grappling with this, of course, because her whole life is just serious. She can't ever just be a teenager, right? The writers just made her go through shit. We realized how in love I think Lizzie was with him. I mean, she was having like apparitions and dreams about her and Johnny growing old together. And I was like, who wrote this? Like, where, where, this is what I said. I say Lizzie is too old for her own good. Like, you have this dance? I want to, but, um, don't tell me. The ex again? This was our song. I haven't talked to him yet. And, you wanted to talk? They were really dragging it. And this is just a very, very side note. But if y'all remember, Johnny Nightingale, when he died, we found out that, cause his mom was a drug addict, we knew that. And we had seen his mom in the show. But Lizzie had ended up finding Johnny's dad. Why was Johnny's dad a white man? Johnny wasn't mixed. He didn't look any bit of mixed. And you guys have a white man as this guy's father who apparently has all this money and is super rich. I was like, save me the tears, cry me a river. I hate when people F up casting that bad because why? And watching it again, I definitely am not buying it and I'm not convinced. We also have Eddie's dad being an alcoholic. That was another side plot that was huge. After Eddie's mom was shot and killed back when Eddie was a teenager, Eddie's dad spiraled into a life of addiction specifically with alcohol he has this rage right he wants revenge and eventually they do run into the guy um who shot eddie's mom and eddie's dad has this revenge plot he wants to kill him he wants him to feel the same pain now do they go through with it no i think eddie's dad's character added some substance to the show as well as kind of tying in eddie's old life um, and how that came back when they moved back to Lincoln Heights. We also have Charles's dad, Charles's biological father, essentially gets back into Charles's life. But instead of embracing Charles like Charles thinks he's doing, Charles's dad really just writes him off like he's his nephew to everybody around him because everyone's gonna talk, right? You're living in this influence circle. When Charles came to stay and went to one of his dad's fancy parties, his dad was like, yeah, my nephew, you know, this is my nephew. And Charles was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm your, I'm your son. And Charles's dad ends up coming around in the end and not being an asshole. But I think that was a pretty vital story, at least for Charles's character. And let's talk about it. These kids. But you know what? I wouldn't be loyal to my parents either. After y'all moved me to this damn neighborhood, all bets are off. But the kids aren't loyal. Cassie and Dana get like this. By the way, Dana is Eddie's first love. He grew up with her. And that's fine. But Dana was talking shit on Jen. Talking about, oh, Jen, you think you're better than everybody. You're nothing. I was his first love. Yada, da, da, da. And the kids don't know all the details, but you know that she was talking about your mom. Okay. It doesn't get any easier than cake mix from the box. Sorry, mom. This is Dana. We met Jennifer Sutton. It's funny running into you here. Isn't there a market closer to you? No, but since you come here, I'll find one. That's the Dana that Dad grew up with? She's like family. Oh, hardly. That woman said she didn't understand why your dad married me. Really? Well, it was cool of her to offer me her recipe for chocolate cake. Hmm. I see it doesn't take much to impress you. And Cassie starts confiding in Dana. She gets very close to Dana. And I'm sitting here like, dude, like if somebody said that shit about my mom, all bets are off. So I was like, unloyal point one. Tay wanting to protect Reuben. Reuben is who shot Eddie's mother back in the day. He was the kid in the gang. He pulled the trigger. Um, he didn't call the shot, but he pulled the trigger. And Reuben is who the granddad wanted to shoot and kill because he realized, oh, this dude is coming around my family. Like, you look real familiar. But Tay is like, no, we can't do this. Like, you guys can't turn him into the cops. You guys can't do this. He's done everything for me. And Reuben did protect Tay um, when he got shot. So he dove in front of Tay and took the bullet for him, which to be honest, that's a, that's that could be a really good, genuine, like, okay, we're good, we're even. But you can never be even about killing somebody's mom. 
So I just thought it was interesting how after Tay knew all of that, I definitely would have felt more animosity. Maybe I could see the humanity in him, but I don't think I would be as forgiving and as like- Yeah, hey, uh, let him go. Don't turn him into the police. If you turn him into the police, his life is over. I don't care. Eddie. Eddie being Nate's father. Nate is Eddie and Dana's son that Eddie did not know he had. I guess Dana was pregnant, you know, some years before Jen and um, Eddie had gotten together and had Cassie. But I guess she just never said anything to him because she didn't want to ruin his life. Season three finale, it was like Eddie was forcing Dana and Nate down Jen's throat. And I think Nate should absolutely be a part of the family. But after Dana has disrespected me, after I open my doors to her, she wants to call me all types of names under the sun. She wants to talk about my parenting, how I think I'm better. I don't need to have a relationship with her. Your kid is grown. He's an adult. Nate can be in your life, but Eddie, like not getting Jen's input or like putting her in uncomfortable positions with Dana, knowing the things that she has said to Jen was crazy to me. Dana coming into the clinic asking for work. She said you sent her. No, I said I talked to you. And the word clinic should not have come out of your mouth. Oh my bad. I was like, there is no loyalty in this circle. Absolutely none. And then last but not least, another point that just pissed me off was Cassie being an ass in the earthquake, trying to get Mac from under the fridge. So Mac is Charles's stepdad, the nasty stepdad that we talked about who sexually tried to abuse Charles and beat up on his mom. So in the earthquake, Mac had came over to the apartment, found Cassie and Charles was like, I'm gonna kill you, Charles. I'm gonna kill you, Charles, da, 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 da. whatever. So the earthquake happened and a fridge fell on Matt. To me, it made sense for them to leave and leave him there. Nobody killed anybody. The fridge fell on Matt. We had to leave. He was trying to kill me. And then Cassie's like, no, we need to pull the fridge up off him. We need to pull the fridge up off him. We can't leave him here. Yes, we can. He just tried to threaten my life. He told me he was going to kill me. The earthquake took him out for us. And you sitting here trying to sympathize with this man when well, we need to be going to find somewhere safe. He was just trying to stab me two seconds ago. And maybe Cassie was right to some extent because then they got into some legal trouble. But the loyalty is not, it's not there. Even with Lizzie being friends with the deacon, after the deacon had smeared Eddie, her father, all over the news after that deli shooting, tried to ruin her father's reputation, get him fired even though he knew the facts. I'm sorry, I could never be that close with you. And these people forgive and forget. So let's talk about the very last episode, how they wrapped up the series. The last episode aired November 9th, 2009. And there was money left in the house, by the way. So remember when we talked about Hazel and that other girl who had broken into their house because they said, oh, this is our house, we own this money. They did actually own this money and they did used to own that house or Charles had found the money in the attic during the earthquake and took it. He found like $50,000, something crazy. Charles took it, didn't tell anybody. Charles ends up giving it back to the family. And Eddie, instead of being like, okay, bro, we'll like take it into the cops. We'll see if they can find the owner. If they don't find it, then we can keep it. What does Eddie do? They're told, hey, you can keep the money. We've investigated the money. We don't know who this belongs to, just keep it. Eddie's like, ugh. I need to find out who the rightful owner is. Da, 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 da. So he keeps going, even though they could have used that money. I think it might've been like a hundred K. So they spend the last season, the last couple episodes, trying to find the rightful owner of the money who does end up being one of the descendants of that family who used to live in the house. Charles goes to the army because he feels like Cassie don't want him no more. Cassie's solution is marry me. Same problems will still exist and they don't end up getting married, but the impetus of that was because he was gonna go to the military, which Lizzie um, is in this play, in this musical. This is where they start to lose me because it, it turned into high school musical a bit. A perfect fantasy. I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, well, since when? They stay in the heights from what we understand the end. There's a lot there, guys. There's absolutely a lot there. But I want to talk about what the show does well. What I really enjoyed about the show. Because I felt like I just spent 50 minutes talking shit on the show. But I think with the best shows, there's flaws. 
But some of those flaws is what makes the mess, mess. I always love seeing a black family in a lead role like this. So that's what drew me to the show initially, even back when I first watched it. Excellent guest, excellent musical guest. They had Elliot Yami. Solange performed on the show. Some of you guys might have not remembered that. I certainly didn't remember. Uh, Trey Songz was a guest on the show a couple times. So they actually, like, they were tapped in with the community. People were definitely watching the show and they were trying to get people involved. Young stars, seasoned stars involved in the show. I loved the ability that the show had to tackle difficult topics, um, but also keep the show family oriented and lighthearted at times, right? There was comedic relief. There was seriousness, but you always felt like home base, they're going to be good. Sometimes when you watch shows like Law & Order or CSI, it's all so heavy. It's all so depressing. It's all so dark. But I liked how they tried to bring in aspects of the children's lives, but how they also did explore the crime and the, the danger in the area. I also think the chemistry of the characters was pretty good. I think the actors were great. And casting is so absolutely important when it comes to making a great show. And let's face it, Lincoln Heights, as much as it pissed me off how they kept staying in this environment, it made for an entertaining show, right? That was the show. Overall, I think that this show is the one of the best that has ever hit the airways, especially for ABC Family. My top three is probably Lincoln Heights, make it or break it and make it or break it. But I wanted to do a deep dive for you guys today because there was so much to be said about that show. There were so many statements made, so many important topics being talked about that were not being discussed at the time openly. And for it to be a black show, a scripted series, not a sitcom, but a scripted series at that point, I think was pretty pivotal. I think that's why it was so popular, especially with black audiences. So like, comment down below. Did you guys used to watch Lincoln Heights? after this deep dive, are you gonna watch it again? Um, and do you think your lens has changed at all on the show or do you think it was just as good as you remember it? And please hit that subscribe button down below if you'd like to see more content like this. Thanks for watching. Merry Christmas, have a happy holidays, happy new year, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.